It's now time to hear another voice. It's uh, the voice of Australia's, he's been called our very own rock star economist, Stephen Kukulis. <laughs> he likes that title. Um, Stephen is one of Australia's leading economic visionaries. He has held senior roles in the corporate world and as advisor to former Prime Minister Julia Gillard. He's also a terrific economics writer, very accessible, and an amazing tweeter. If you don't follow him, you should. You might wonder what on earth we're doing having an economist as top billing speaker at a communities conference. First up, well, like it or hate it, the reality is we are all of us subject to the forces of economics. We can choose to ignore that force or we can in fact engage, understand and seek some influence over it. Because in the end, economies exist to serve people and not the opposite. So let's try to shape that economy to serve us all and to serve the whole community better. And I think there's no one better to help us along that path than Stephen Kukulis. Could you please make him welcome? But thank you for that very kind introduction. And, uh, Look, the economy matters. Um, before I get started, I'm just going to give a little bit of a background. Look, I am an economist. I live in Canberra. I used to be a banker. I do use PowerPoint. And I'm a Collingwood supporter. So I don't know which of those is the worst. But uh, apart from that, some people say that I'm not a bad guy. So that's just a bit of background to sort of get the show started. And, and, and in a funny way, when you look at the economy, um, it does matter. The economy is really important for issues of fairness, equity, decency and these sorts of things because without economic growth it's very, very hard to provide decent education, health care, disability care, to build decent roads and these sorts of things that are obviously so important for the well-being of the economy. Now before I get into it, I'm just a few really important, what I think are important, basic facts about the Australian economy. This year our economy is going to be producing gross domestic product, that's all the output of the economy, of about $1.65 trillion. We're the 12th biggest country in the world in US dollar terms. Not bad given that we're 52nd in terms of our population. So we're, we're a big economy. We're, we're, we're doing really well. And of that $1.65 trillion, if you're good at maths and divide by 365 days, we produce over $4.5 billion a day in GDP. So our decisions to spend, to build stuff, to go out and uh, all the rest of it feeds into a, what is a really big economy. Interestingly, if we look at our wealth per capita, now this is not a distribution thing, but it's just the, the total GDP, GDP divided by our population, we are the fifth richest country in the world in US dollar terms again. The only countries that have a higher per capita GDP than Australia at the moment are Luxembourg, Qatar, Norway, can't remember the fifth one, fourth one, but we, we're doing really well. We are a rich economy. So when you think about issues of fairness and distribution and uh, well-being, you think, well, why aren't we doing a little bit better given how prosperous we are? And that's where the inequality issue comes a little bit later. And the other thing to remember is that we've had 24 years without a recession. We're into our 25th starting, starting soon. Isn't that remarkable? That is actually good news because we just have to look at places like the Eurozone, for example. Look at Greece, look at Spain, look at Ireland and uh, these sorts of really troublesome economies. When you do have a recession, when something goes wrong in the economy, be it poor policy or poor um, regulation of the corporate sector and the banks blow up and all these other things happen, unemployment gets to 20 or in the case of Greece, 25%. Youth unemployment gets to 50%. Half of the youth are unemployed. Um, services are cut. You, again, it's uh, look at the um, decisions on, in Ireland and Greece and all those countries that I mentioned in, in the Eurozone and in America, of course, when they had their recession a couple of years ago. Services are cut. Healthcare is cut. It's very, very hard for governments who are highly indebted in a recession to maintain their funding. So in a sense, that's what gets to my first slide, hopefully. And... Economics matters, and growing an economy matters. Now, hopefully this is relatively non-controversial. There are issues about measuring GDP. So if you chop down a forest and sell it, that is GDP for sure. So I'll just put aside some of those issues. They are important. But 
what matters is in terms of the themes I'm going to go through today is growing the economy. If you grow the economy, you can create jobs. That's critical. So there's nothing worse, in my view, than running an economy that doesn't have something close to full employment. Giving everybody a job gives them a purpose, an income that they can do, you know, the, the, the basic things in life. And if they happen to achieve, you know, well, they can do some nice things in life. If you happen to be one of those people who gets lucky, earns a few extra dollars, and you can do a few nice things in life. It raises living, living standards. The critical issue, I think, in all of this is that you've, it's got to be done fairly and with a degree of equity in it. Now, I don't mind you know, Bill Gates inventing windows and getting you know, 50 billion or 80 billion, I don't know how much money he's got good on him, he's done something very, very clever. Um, but what does matter, and we've seen this in the debate currently about corporates, big companies in Australia not paying their fair share of tax, having their headquarters in Singapore or the Bahamas or somewhere uh, and not paying tax. You, know, you and I spend our money at these shops and buying these things, on the assumption that if the company makes money, good on them, but they've got to pay their fair share of tax. And I think that's one of the issues that's got to be continually looked at uh, over the course of the next few years, a really big, important public policy issue. So fairness and equity. And I think uh, most people don't mind paying tax as long as everyone else pays their fair share. Where people get really annoyed is if I'm paying my share of tax as a wage and salary earner, but someone else isn't because they've got some complex, dodgy, albeit legal, system set up so they don't pay any tax. That's unfair. That's, that's why people feel resentful about those sorts of things. So, again, people are happy to pay tax. They see the money going into decent things in life, but nonetheless, it's got to be fair and equitable. And then there's the economic management issue. My goodness, I've been so frustrated. Uh, yeah, if you follow me on Twitter, you can probably see how cross I get sometimes. And I think Q&A tonight with Joe Hockey's on q and I'll be really cross again. Like, I can just tell. I know it's going to be... I know I'm going to be tweeting like a crazy cat tonight. But anyway. <laughs> but it's the issue of debt and deficit. You know, and, and managing an economy. And you know, I, I worked for the previous government. It was a lot of fun, really interesting, and all the rest of it. But what's the point of having no debt and running a deficit if your unemployment rate's 10%? Stupid economics, dumb policy, really dumb. Just, I'll, I'll turn this around to, to sort of just give you the balance, there would be no point running a big budget deficit if your economy was booming. You use economic policy, or you should use economic policy, to manage the business cycle. Now, things happen to Australia and to every other country. Iron ore prices go up, they go down. House prices go up, they go down. Interest rates go up and down. The Aussie dollar goes up and down. That influences how the economy performs. Of course it does. It matters a lot to how our economy grows. But if you're a policymaker sitting in Canberra and you see the economy being weak, for whatever reason, doesn't matter what the reason is really, but if you see the economy being weak, the unemployment rate ratcheting higher, what should you do? You should spend a bit more money. You should run a deficit for a few years until the economy gets really strong again and then you wind it back. Sounds really simple, doesn't it? Yeah, no one does it. <laughs> well, the, the previous government tried to, uh, but it just sort of shows the frustration of having uh, the objective being a budget surplus or a little bit of government debt or no debt when, um, when the economy is in trouble. So the, the, the argument about government debt and deficits, sort of, I often get asked the question, well, is a budget deficit good or bad? But it's a bit like asking the question, is sunshine, a sunny day, a beautiful sunny day, good or bad? Well, if you're a holiday maker and you're at the beach, a sunny day is fantastic. If you're a farmer, out bush, it hasn't rained for two years, you're trying to grow a crop and it's a sunny day, it's a disaster. So it's a bit like saying, is a budget deficit bad or good? It depends. If your economy is weak, a deficit's good. If your economy is strong, then a deficit's Bad. You shouldn't be running a budget deficit when your economy is strong. And what's happened to the Australian economy over the last five or six years? Even though we avoided a recession during the GFC, we've still had a, what we call a weak economy. It's generally been uh, weak, and this next slide will show how the unemployment rate, hopefully you can all see that there, or look at the back screens, um, you can see that over the last couple of years, the unemployment rate's been creeping up and up and up. Yeah, you know, we had that terrific period from uh, the mid-90s through to about 2007, before the GFC really hit us, the unemployment rate got to 4%. Fantastic. Really good news. Could have been 3 but let's take 4 as being not a bad outcome. GFC came along. The unemployment rate did go up. As you can see there, it went to about 5 and 3 quarter percent at the peak. 
but the stimulus measures, the running of budget deficits, interest rate cuts, and a little bit of good luck from China remaining strong, helping our export sector, stopped our economy going into recession. We spent the money in the stimulus measures. The unemployment rate went back down to about uh, four and three quarter percent. Now, in the last couple of years, you can see the unemployment rate creeping up very, very slowly, but very, very steadily. It's above six percent. And it's been above six percent for basically the past year now. So it, it is a problem. It's, it's telling me that the economy has been too weak. It's telling me that policy settings, including from our friends at the Reserve Bank, who said interest rates, of course, uh, has been too tight. You, know, you can choose your level of unemployment. The former RBA governor, Ian McFarlane, um, who was a really interesting, vibrant sort of policy maker, one of the really good and interesting people about how he managed interest rates. No, he doesn't run the budget, of course, or he didn't run the budget. Unemployment is a matter of choice. You can choose an unemployment rate if you're a policy maker. Now, some, in, the, in the short term, I hate to be short term, long term, but in the short term, something comes along, the unemployment rate spikes up. You can either choose to leave it there or you can choose to do something about it. And again, it comes to fiscal policy stimulus. And this is the quite funny thing um, about the budget that came out a few weeks ago, whenever that was, um, is that the, the budget was framed with forecasts of the unemployment rate staying above 6%, in fact, increasing a little bit more in the next uh, 9 to 12 months, going back up to 6.5%, uh, and staying there for the next two and a half years. So the government's chosen, specifically, to have a higher unemployment rate. You've got to remember that, uh, that um, a 6% unemployment rate's about um, 750, 760,000 people. That's a lot of people who are unemployed. When you think about it, in a, rather than 6%, what's that mean? It's almost three quarters of a million people. So if it gets to 6.5%, it'll be over 800,000 people. That's a choice. Now, this is where the other interesting policy issues come in, because a high unemployment rate means that wages growth is very weak. Now, I won't do a survey here, but uh, I dare say most people are not getting big pay rises. In fact, we're seeing it from uh, a number of the unions at the moment, the public sector, wage claims are all one and a half, two percent really low wages claims. And when you've got high unemployment, when you've got three quarters of a million people unemployed, it's very hard to put your hand up and say, oh gee, that one and a half percent pay rise you're giving me is pretty rotten because your chances of achieving a bigger pay rise are quite low. Now, you can see they're both public sector and private sector wages, they're at, they're at record lows. And it's because the unemployment rate's going up. And what that means is it's a rather simple sort of equation. Uh, because when you think about inflation um, in Australia, it's, it's on average 2.5%. That's the RBA target. So if wages growth, as was in the previous couple of decades, about 35 3 3.25%, you're getting a real wage increase every year. So if your wage is going up at three and a half, price is going up at two and a half, you're 1% better off over the course of the year. Doesn't sound much, but you accumulate that over 10, 15, 20 years, and your living standards go up because of that. But when wages growth is at two and a half, prices are going up at two and a half, um, you, you've got no real wage increase. In that earlier example, you can afford to spend more money. Your real wages are going up, so at the end of the day, you've got a bit of money left over, so you'll spend some more money, you'll do something and the economy has a self-fulfilling growth momentum. Right now, when wages are barely or not even keeping up with inflation, consumer spending, not surprisingly, is quite weak because people don't have spare cash. The only way people can increase their spending when wages growth is running at the same rate as inflation is either to run down their savings that's probably not a great economic solution to the problem. Or they can borrow more. That's certainly happening in the property market. But again, there's concerns about people having too much debt and bidding up house prices to these sort of crazy levels that we're seeing, particularly in Sydney. Um, and, that, and that's an issue of economic management too. And that's why the Reserve Bank was reluctant to cut interest rates. So you get this problem occurring when wages growth is too low. So I'm not advocating we you know, all got, put our hand up for 10% wage increases. No, but what I'm saying is that we've got to have a policy setting in place that grows the economy faster, generates a bit of employment, and that that leads to some increase in real wages. It, has to, it can be a modest increase, but something that just improves living standards. It's all about the economy growing strongly. Now, again, I hope you can see this chart. It's, a, it's trying to show that what's happening also in terms of uh, fairness and equity, if you like, 
is that long-term unemployment's on, on the rise. That green coloured line, as you can see there, hopefully, that's short-term unemployment. That's people who are unemployed for less than four weeks. I don't have any problem with that. It's like someone resigning from their job today, they have a couple of weeks off and they start their new job in a few weeks. Fine, that's normal churn in the labour market. You know, we've all done that at some stage in our lives. You know, you change jobs, you have a couple of weeks off in between. That's short-term unemployment. And remarkably, that line's steady. That hasn't changed. It, it rarely does. It's a bit over 1% of the workforce. There's always changing jobs. That's fine. You look at medium-term unemployment. That's people who have been employed for between one month and a year. Now, before the GFC hit, as you can see there, it got down to just about 2%, or a little above 2% of the workforce. It shot up during the GFC, came back a little bit, but now that trend increase, apart from that last data point, but the in increase is quite clearly there. There are more and more people who have been employed for between one month and 12 months. That's a bit of a worry, but then you look at the final line, the blue line, which is long-term unemployment. People have been unemployed for a year or more. That was nice and low before the GFC, although having said that, three quarters of a percent of the workforce is still too high, but it was actually relatively low. Look what's been happening, it's been grinding higher all for the last five years. So basically what you can assume from this chart here is that all of the increase in the unemployment rate in that chart that I showed you a couple of charts ago is long-term unemployed. And when you've been unemployed for a year or more, well, there's um, motivational issues, there's, uh, you lose your skills, you're not working, you lose uh, an ability to engage with the labour market. So when a job comes up, you probably lose your enthusiasm for, for looking for a job. It's soul destroying and that's a, a, most economic theories, most economic research on long-term unemployment does actually lead to the conclusion that once it's very, very hard for somebody who's been unemployed for a long time to reattach to the labour market and get themselves a job. So again, that's pretty unfair, isn't it? And particularly when we're the fifth richest country in the world, you think, well, oh, surely, surely there's a policy in place that can make sure that all people unemployed, whether it's for one month or two years, can be retrained, reskilled, maintain their attachment to the labour market, so that when the economy is stronger, which I think is the most important thing, but when the economy is stronger, there's a job for them to do. And I also think back to the pre period just prior to the global financial crisis. Don't know if you remember it, but when the economy was very strong in 2006, 2007, when the economy was booming, we had a skill shortage. Remember that? Some of these big mining companies were looking to hire people and it was spilling over into you know, the hospitality section throughout Perth and other parts of the, the economy. Well, a skill shortage means that you know, when a firm wants to hire someone, all the people who apply for them don't have the skills, by definition. But that occurred with the unemployment rate at 4% still. So, OK, 4% is a low unemployment rate, but why don't we have a target to make that 3% at the low point? Or 2.5%, I don't know, something lower, because every percentage point on, on uh, unemployment is 150, 200,000 people. How, how could it be possible that we had, back in 2007, still 550, 600,000 people unemployed and a skill shortage? I'd be spending money retraining, reskilling people because it's, it's fair and it's equitable giving people a chance to have a job. Now, how do we grow the economy faster? You know, we, we can't control the iron ore price that China pays us, despite Twiggy's efforts to <laughs> see if we can. Uh, but we can't control the iron ore price. We can't control the world economy. You know, we've only got limited control over some other parts of the, of the economy. But there are a couple of things that we can do. And this is uh, infrastructure spending. Sounds simple. Let's build the second airport in Sydney. Hooray, they're doing that after all, all these years. Let's make sure our rail, public transport facilities, even roads to some extent are an important part of infrastructure, uh, that they're all as good and as efficient as they can be. And it's really, really simple. The benefits to the economy of building infrastructure are huge. Not only when you're building it, so when you're building that airport in Sydney, for example, you know, you're putting concrete and wires and the buildings and the terminal and all that sort of stuff, it creates jobs when you're doing it. Obviously, when it's finished, you're actually increasing the capacity of the economy to grow faster. So more planes can come in with tourists who want to spend their money here. Great for our economy. Uh, business people can come here very easily. And for the fast-growing region in Asia, for example, who want our fresh, 
fruit and, and uh, seafood and all these other things, you've got the freight facilities to send the stuff back out. So not only do you have the benefit of when the thing's being built, you're creating jobs, you're creating opportunities, and the economy is stronger, much, much stronger. But when the thing's finished, your ability to grow your economy faster, to generate jobs, and to maintain that wonderful, virtuous cycle of economic activity is also greatly enhanced. It's, it, it says to me that it's such a simple thing. And if you look at this chart, um, you can see what's, ha what's happening to it. My goodness, I think it's falling off a cliff. Because this is basically public construction work done. That's, for all intents and purposes, infrastructure spending. You can see the uh, building the education revolution during the GFC, which is the bottom green line, the bar went straight up. School halls and things like that were built, and then it fell back down. But what's happening now is that it's falling further. That, I think, is a really bad thing. It's a really bad thing that just hasn't been addressed by the government. They talk about it. They have arguments with state governments about asset recycling and all this other stuff. That Just get on with it. You know, economics shouldn't be that difficult. It's just, just implement the policy. You know, it, it's, is it obvious? I think it is. Let's just build this infrastructure. And the other thing that makes it even more perplexing is a chart of interest rates. This is the 10-year government bond yield. That's the, the price, that, not you and me, we can't borrow money at this cheap. Um, but the government, through the financial markets, where I used to work all those years ago, go to the capital markets and they can borrow money for a 10-year term, a 10-year government bond, and they're currently paying under 3%. Wouldn't you love to borrow money for 10 years at 3%? How much would you borrow? You know, it'd be amazing. But the government, because of their debt and deficit fetish and, you know, whatever, don't want to borrow. They, don't, they want to try to pay for it from recurrent revenue. Oh, we can't borrow money. We can't, you know, ever have a concern about our def debt and deficit levels. Whereas some people, some of us, are suggesting that these incredibly low interest rates. And I don't know how long they're going to last. I've been around long enough to know that interest rates change. In fact, just look back 10 years ago, a 10-year government bond was between 5 and 6%. It was above 6% at some stage. OK, it's still relatively low interest rates, but now they're less than 3 It's half the borrowing cost. And for Australia, with its AAA credit rating, with really low levels of government debt, being a rich economy, a decent economy, foreign investors would fund it like there's no tomorrow. You know, it, the thing to remember about this is that if you had the government and they decided, let's, let's borrow 10 billion, 20 billion, I don't know, whatever number you want, you pick a number, and we're going to allocate that specifically for these infrastructure projects. So it's sort of off budget, so it's separate from the budget, because if it gets caught up in the budget, then it's all tangled up with revenue from GST and company tax and all that other stuff. If you have it off budget, like the NBN was funded, for example, you can see we've borrowed exactly this much. This is what we're doing with the money. These are our annual interest costs for this project. And who knows, maybe at the end of the day, you can sell them to the private sector when they're built. Or you just collect tolls if they're a road, or you collect revenue if it's an airport. You, do, you, know, you can fund it down the track. But in the meantime, you grow your economy more quickly, more uh, rapidly, and you're generating jobs not only today, as I said before, you're improving the productive capacity of the economy. And you just have to, if you travel around the world sometimes, you have to see the poor quality infrastructure in some countries. It holds back their ability to grow. And infrastructure does actually relate to things like power generation too. Without electricity, goodness knows where we'd be. So you need the government sector to be providing this infrastructure to allow your economy to be a little bit stronger, creating a few more jobs and growing more rapidly. Make sense? Makes sense to me. Now here's my favourite chart, and it looks like a dog's breakfast, I'm sorry. And um, it's from um, Justin Wolfus, who's one of the professors at Harvard, I think. So I, I, I'll explain it for a second. On the bottom is per capita GDP. So as you move from left to right, it's higher per capita GDP. There is some weird company that measures happiness in each country, and a degree of happiness. What this chart shows is that if you have more money, you're happier. Now, would you be happy if I gave each of you $1,000? Yeah, I'm not going to do it, I'm sorry. I'd be happy if you each gave me $1,000. No, no. It's not meant to be um, showing that people are greedy and nasty and you know, they want more money and all these other sort of things. But what it shows, if you've got money, 
if you've got a strong economy and you can sort of, and these are all different countries, so there's Hong Kong, yeah, all the rich countries in the top right hand part, and all the poor countries, Benin, Togo, with, with per capita GDP of $1,000 or $500, they're not very happy. Yeah, the kids are dying, they can't feed themselves, they can't, you know, it's horrid. So money does give an opportunity. This is the sort of the economist in me coming out of here. Yeah, I like growing an economy because it gives opportunity, wealth, and expansion. You can fund your health care, you can educate your kids, you can do a whole lot of things, and your whole economic well-being improves if an economy has more wealth in it. So that's why I like growing the economy. That's why I like infrastructure spending. That's why you know, managing the business cycle is really, really important. And it's a really, really simple chart, I think, that just illustrates quite nicely why growing an economy is good. Why increasing living standards? And the question that doesn't come into this, if we had a three-dimensional one, it's my wish one day to have a three-dimensional chart, is to sort of say, well, um, there's an, there's an uh, income distribution component to that. Because I, I don't know which one is the USA. I think I do know the USA. It's just sort of in that right-hand side. One of the things about the US, even though most people are happy there, the degree of income inequality has worsened, that it's become less equal over, since the GFC. Um, there's still a rich economy, but there are chronic problems there that healthcare is starting to decline, that uh, living, uh, the rise in um, um, life expectations is slowing down. It hasn't quite fallen yet, but it's changing. Their economy is a bit weaker. People can't afford to go to um, the doctor despite Obamacare. There are issues that are associated with increasing inequality or a weakening economy. So both go, go hand in hand. And this is, um, um, uh, apologies to the French econom economist Thomas Piketty. I, you, you've probably heard about the book. I guarantee I'll never read the damn thing. It's 700 pages and I just can't concentrate that long anymore. Um, I have trouble getting through all of MasterChef working out what they're cooking, but anyway. Um, but Thomas Piketty has written, and I've, re I've read lots of reviews though, <laughs> so, and uh, my good friend Andrew Lee has explained it to me, so he, he knows what he's talking about. Um, it's about how greater equality income equality is good for the economy. It's about this growth thing that I was talking about. And this is a stylized example, or a bastardized example, if you like. So just say there are 10 billionaires, and you give them a billion bucks each. And I don't mean to pick on Gina Reinhart, but I will. Um, so she's got $20 billion at the moment, right? She spends her money and does all these things with her money. Good honor, whatever, whatever. I'm not getting into that sort of thing necessarily. But if you gave her an extra billion dollars, do you think she'd spend any more on things? I don't know. I don't know. The price of iron ore changing by 50 cents probably adjusts her wealth by a billion dollars. I don't know. It doesn't matter. So in a sense, if, if, the, if she gets really, really rich by an extra billion dollars, the effect on the economy, on spending, on GDP, on jobs, probably wouldn't be that much. She'd still be doing whatever she's doing. That's fine. Whatever. Good on her. But... If you had a billion dollars and you gave a thousand dollars each to a million of the low income earners, the poorest if you like, you gave them each twenty dollars a week for a year, that's a thousand dollars roughly. Twenty bucks a week extra either in their pension, in their pay, in some form of distribution, greater equality, less inequality. Now we know every economic theory book says that the low income earners have a high, they call it marginal propensity to consume. They spend the money they get. They have to, just for subsistence, just to have a roof over their head and a decent feed every day. You give them an extra $20, you give the poorest people an extra $20 through an income distribution to the low end of the scale, they'll spend it. They'll either bring forward the purchase of an essential item that they couldn't otherwise afford, once every few weeks, they might do something nice. They might go out for dinner and go to the movies or something. But as they spend that money, the economy gets a boost. They go to the local corner shop. They buy something. The economy is stronger. So those million people with $1,000 a year extra <laughs> spend the economy. And what happens to the economy? It's much stronger. It grows faster. And this is the, this is the Piketty thesis distilled into, like, 90 seconds, <laughs> if you like. But it works. The economy is stronger. Job creation is, is there. Um, you're giving 
money to people who are inclined to spend it, rather than a high income, you know, a high wealth person who's spending all they can anyway. There's only so much more that they can spend. So again, this, this is sort of the end point of the, of the process about income distribution. Now, I'm not saying we tax the rich massively and give it all to the poor, but I am saying that policy, we've got a progressive income tax structure. You know, $18,200 uh, is tax-free of your, of your income, and then it goes up to 47 cents in the dollar and 49 with this extra levy. Great. Good progressive income tax um, structure. Some of the personal benefit payments are skewed to low income earners, as they should be. If we take a little step over time towards more of those policies, so that someone who's got five billion, 10 billion, doesn't notice that they're paying an extra $10 million a year in tax, they won't even know. They won't, it's the fluctuation in the share price of whatever they own by a cent or something like that. And you redistribute that to low income earners, your economy's faster, it grows more, there are more jobs, people are better off, and when there's more jobs and a, a stronger economy, um, governments can afford to provide healthcare, education, all these things that we find so dear and are so important, in my view, to running an economy in a decent, fair way. Thank you, Stephen. You've been really engaging, so can we all join together and thank, oh, thank you, Stephen.